Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am so pleased to introduce this event with Mario Livio, presenting his latest book, Galileo and the Science Deniers. Tonight's event is an installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series. We are so excited to continue the work of bringing the authors of recently published science-related literature to our community during these unprecedented times. Just like always, you can find announcements about upcoming events in this series at harvard.com slash events slash science. You can also sign up for our email newsletter at harvard.com for more updates. And additionally, we have a science research public lecture series YouTube page where you can see previous talks that you might have missed in the series. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask the author something, please go to the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit your question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also at the bottom of the screen during the presentation, you will see a button to purchase tonight's featured book, Galileo and the Science Deniers, through our partners at Bookshop. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so a huge thank you for your support during this difficult time. Your purchases and your financial contributions. There is also a donate button at the bottom of the screen. Make this virtual author series possible. And now more than ever, they ensure the, they ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you also to our partners at Harvard University. And thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science because it really matters. And finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few weeks, technical issues can arise. And if they do, we're going to do our best to resolve them quickly. And thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. So now I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. A world-renowned astrophysicist and best-selling author, Mario Livio is known for his many previous award-winning books, which include Why, What Makes Us Curious, The Golden Ratio, Brilliant Blunders, is God a Mathematician, The Accelerating Universe, and The Equation That Couldn't Be Solved, which was the basis for an Emmy-nominated NOVA program. As a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Dr. Livio has made significant theoretical contributions to topics ranging from cosmology, supernova explosions and black holes, to extrasolar planets and the emergence of life in the universe. Living in this dual world of scientific research and popular renown, he has appeared on numerous programs such as The Daily Show, 60 Minutes, All Things Considered, On Being, and many others. Tonight, he is with us presenting his seventh book, Galileo and the Science Deniers, which has been hailed as a beautifully written, enthralling, and insightful history of a courageous genius. Particularly in light of our current situation and in light of the climate crisis, Bill McKibben writes of the book, quote, one would have hoped that the Galileo story could be treated just as the fascinating history that this book makes clear it is. But we really need this story because we are living through the next chapter of science denial with stakes that could not be higher. We are so happy to have him digitally here tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Dr. Livio. Thank you very much. Uh, with your permission, I will now try to share the screen. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes. And uh, just one second. Okay. Galileo awesome. and the Science Deniers. Uh, this is, by the way, the cover of the book. Uh, so uh, some people ask me, why did I decide to write this book? Um, so uh, there are very simple reasons. Uh, one is that I'm an astrophysicist. Galileo is the founder of modern astronomy and astrophysics. So yeah, I was always fascinated by him. He's a fascinating person in general. And this business of science denial, which unfortunately we still have to deal with, today. So these are, I think, good enough reasons to do this. So I started by uh, noting the fact that uh, Galileo is, oh, wait. I, I apologize. But, but the, 
my presentation jumped to the very last slide. So I will start again. So I start with the fact that Gar Galileo is really a larger than life hero of our intellectual history and for reasons that many of you know, I'm sure, but some of you will find out here. So because he was such a, a, a hero, uh, many works of art in various areas uh, of the humanities were devoted to him. So I've, I've just collected a few, for example, of paintings that where he's being painted and I, I just throw them one on top of the other like you would take a bunch of photographs you know and look at them and throw them one on top of the other so this is the very earliest portrait known of Galileo uh, when he was about 40 or so it was done by an unknown Tuscan painter uh, you will notice that his eyes are not symmetric which uh, there was some something that appeared in other paintings as well he's probably had a problem there uh, this is a painting at a later age. Uh, this particular painting is uh, attributed to the famous painter Tintoretto, uh, but it's not clear whether that is actually true or not. Uh, this is one of the most famous paintings of Galileo by Sustermans. Uh, he's holding a telescope in his hand, and we will be talking about that. But Galileo appeared in many other types of paintings. For example, here is a painting of him uh, look, showing the Doge of Venice uh, through the telescope to try to observe things. And uh, th this is even a cartoonish-like painting actually done in the last century uh, with Galileo trying to explain his discoveries to people from the Catholic Church. But in addition to just, you know, regular standard classical paintings, there are other types of works of art, for example, pop art. Uh, so he appears, you know, in pop art, uh, he appears even in graffiti. I was in Florence as part of the research for this book, and I saw this on one of the uh, walls of the houses in, in Florence. Uh, you see, here he's painted as, uh, you know, as if he's scuba diving or something. Um, of course, uh, he made it to the Google Doodle as well, the telescope. Um, and uh, he made it into works of art in other areas. Uh, there is a very, very famous Bertolt Brecht play, uh, The Life of Galileo. This is a scene from one of the productions. And there is even an opera written about Galileo by Philip Glass. Um, I, I actually have a small piece of that opera, uh, but uh, believe it or not, uh, we were unable to uh, make the sound work on this shared screen through Crowdcast. So you will not hear the music, but you will see at least the images from the opera by Philip Glass. So here are those images. Uh, and uh, imagine that here there is some uh, some singing going on, uh, only that it, it doesn't happen. Oh, and not only it doesn't happen, but in fact, even the the things don't advance, which is even worse. Uh, I cannot tell you why that is happening. So I will just jump over that. And let me jump to the discoveries. <coughs> I apologize. I um, I never used Crowdcast before, and uh, I, I don't know how to arrange any kind of technicalities here. So the discoveries. So some of the discoveries... Uh, had to do with pure physics. Uh, Galileo was very, very interested in free fall. Um, and in free fall, in particular, he dropped objects from certain heights. Uh, myth has it that he dropped objects from the Leaning Tower uh, of Pisa. Uh, as far as I could tell, based on my research, he probably has never done that. He did drop balls from various heights, but... Uh, I found no real reliable evidence that he dropped it from the Leaning Tower, even though his first biographer, Viviani, uh, wrote that he did. But uh, Viviani wrote that when Galileo was very old, Viviani was extremely young, so uh, embellishments could happen on both sides. Um, uh, in any case, uh, what he suspected was that uh, and wanted to study was whether or not heavy balls indeed fall faster than light balls. Because Aristotle said 
that the heavier the ball, uh, the faster it falls. And uh, not only that, but that it fall, falls faster in proportion to the, to the weight. And Galileo wanted to test that. But you see, at the time of Galileo, uh, there were no good time measuring devices. So to measure small differences in time was very, very difficult. So he came up with this incredibly clever idea of uh, using inclined planes. Uh, he, he realized that, you know, free fall is in some sense can be seen as a, an extreme case of balls rolling down inclined planes when the, when the inclined plane is actually vertical to the ground. Uh, but by making the angle of the inclined plane very, very small, he was able to sort of dilute gravity, if you like, to slow down the motion sufficiently so that he could make uh, more uh, accurate uh, measurements for the, for the motion. Uh, but he did more than that. By allowing the ball to roll down a plane and then fly into the air, he was able to see the trajectory that projectiles do when thrown into the air. And he discovered that the trajectory is actually a curve that was well known from antiquity, from the ancient Greeks. This is the curve of the parabola. And he was the very first uh, to discover that, that uh, the projectiles uh, trace a parabola as they go through the air. Uh, he also discovered, you know, laws of free fall that, uh, for example, that the distance traveled uh, is proportional to the square of the time, uh, meaning uh, if a ball falls for, you know, twice, let's say one ball falls for a second, another for two seconds, the ball that falls for two seconds covers the distance that is four times, and it is two squared, uh, the distance covered by the ball that falls only one second and many other such things. Of course, his most famous discoveries were with a telescope. So he did not invent the telescope. The telescope was invented in the Netherlands, but as soon as he heard about the invention, he realized that this could be a fantastic instrument. Um, he basically took uh, tubes from uh, organs and uh, polished his own lenses and put two lenses at the two ends of these tubes. These are two of his original telescopes. In fact, the only two that survived, uh, they are at the Galileo Museum in Florence. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of uh, using this telescope to look at uh, ships, after all, he was, you know, in the Venetian Republic, or to look, uh, I don't know, to spy on his neighbors, uh, he instead uh, turned the, his telescope to the skies. And there he saw incredible things. Uh, this was one of the lenses that he uh, polished. Uh, it has now this uh, very ornate um, sort of frame around it, but this is the, the, the lens. He very quickly managed to uh, generate telescopes uh, that had a power of about 20. I mean, the t original telescopes had only a power of, of, of about four, and he uh, did uh, telescopes that had a power of 20. Now, when he looked, the first object he looked to was the moon. Um, and here is the first encounter that we have with a situation where Galileo's artistic education helped him in his scientific discoveries. You see, at the same time, uh, there was this English uh, astronomer, Harriot, who also looked at the moon. But um, when you look at what he drew from what he saw, you, you cannot understand anything, and neither did Harriot uh, himself, even though he saw some features there. But Galileo, because of his training in drawing uh, as an artist and his understanding of light and shadow, he understood immediately that what he was observing was a rugged surface of the moon, a surface with mountains, with craters, uh, by looking at the dark part, you know, near the terminator, if you look, for example, at the bottom right uh, small figure, uh, the one that has three above it, um, you will see that there are points of light uh, in the dark side, in the dark part, sorry, the unilluminated part, I mean. And uh, he understood that that actually was tops of mountains. 
that were illuminated by the sun and he noticed that you know as the time was progressing you know light sort of was creeping down the mountain just as it would do on earth so he understood very well uh, what he was seeing here and this was also extremely important because until that time uh, the idea was that there was a huge difference between things terrestrial and celestial uh, things on earth were supposed to be corruptible uh, full of blemishes they could die but things in the skies in the heavens were supposed to be pristine you know perfect and no blemishes what he showed was that the moon had a surface you know just about like the surface of the earth and of course we know now that to be true and this is an image uh, taken by astronaut bill anders uh, from actually the orbiter of the moon uh, is apollo astronaut and you can see the hills and some craters on the surface of the moon and of course we also see the earth rise there this has become a very very famous painting uh, because of that um, as i told you he galileo studied um also free falling objects and uh what he concluded at the end which was amazing was that actually all objects in free fall uh, fall exactly at the same rate irrespective of their weight um, but and the only difference that we observe here on earth is because of the air's resistance now at his time there still were no vacuum pumps so he couldn't actually perform experiments in vacuum so it was really more his intuition and basing his things on thought experiments of thinking you know what would happen if you drop a heavy ball and and, and a light ball um, this experiment was done on the moon uh, by astronaut scott and i want to show you the video of that now but i'm now a little bit concerned because that video also has sound in it and since the sound doesn't work i'm not sure if the video itself will work but let's see Now, I don't know if you hear him, but he has a hammer and feather on the other. And he's going to drop both of them on the moon. And you see that they hit the ground at the same time. And he says, I guess Mr. Galileo was correct. Uh, again, I'm not sure if you heard the sound, but uh, I'm telling you what he was saying. Uh, he said, we got here to the moon because of a certain gentleman named Galileo, uh, who made some certain discoveries about falling objects, and then he did this experiment. Um, now, turning his telescope to other celestial objects, he discovered uh, four satellites of Jupiter. Um, and that was an immense discovery. This is the very first document where he describes it. Uh, this is in the bottom half of a letter he wrote to the Doge of Venice. Uh, and you can see his drawings, uh, very simple drawings showing uh, four. Sometimes you see all four satellites. Sometimes he saw only three, only two, two on one side, two on the other side, three on one side, one on the other side, and so on. Uh, but the importance of this uh, discovery cannot be you know overemphasized the thing is the following first of all these were the very first objects since antiquity new object discovered in the solar system second the the people who uh, objected to the copernican model you see uh, at the time what was still prevailing was basically the aristotelian and ptolemaic model where uh, the idea was that all the planets and the sun uh, revolved around the earth um, galileo adopted the copernican model copernican lived some decades before him and wrote his book um, where uh, all the planets including the earth revolved around the sun 
Now, people who objected to this raised a variety of objections. Some of those were the following. They said, wait a second, if the Earth is really just another planet, like all other planets, how come it is the only planet that has a moon? Well, Galileo showed that Jupiter has not just one moon, but even four moons. Second, they were saying, oh, well, if the Earth were to revolve around the sun, surely it would have lost its moon. How come that it manages to preserve its moon? Well, here was Jupiter revolving around something. You choose, choose whether you want to make it revolve around the Earth or the sun, but obviously keeping its four moons. So that killed that objection as well. So this was extraordinarily important. Uh, it is less known that uh, Galileo also detected the planet Neptune, in 1612. This is the point that you see on the very left of the figure. Uh, now, he didn't recognize it as a planet because his telescope wasn't good enough and observations not long enough to actually be able to tell that it was moving, but he did detect it. Uh, the discovery of Neptune was delayed until the middle of the 19th century when it, it was really discovered to be a planet. Uh, one of the most important discoveries of Galileo, and, and by all means, I'm not giving you all of them, just, you know, a flavor of his discoveries, is the phases, the phases of the planet Venus. You see, the thing is like this. Venus was known to be between the Earth and the Sun. And if Venus is revolving around the Sun, then it should show a whole set of phases just like the Moon. For example, when it is the farthest from the Earth, as in the top of the figure, it should look smallest and fully lit. When it is closest to Earth, as is in the bottom of the figure, it should look largest and basically dark. And in between, it should show these various crescent phases, just like the Moon. This does not is not expected if Venus was revolving around the Earth. So by showing this, uh, Galileo uh, gave a strong argument uh, perhaps the strongest uh, against the Aristotelian or Ptolemaic model. I want now to uh, move to something else, and uh, which is particularly important since we are talking, you know, in, in the context of a bookstore and so on. Um, there is this uh, author and chemist, uh, C.P. Snow, who in the 1950s noticed the following. He noticed in England that starting from about the 30s, um, people in the literary circles uh, started to refer to themselves as the intellectuals, uh, thereby excluding scientists from that definition. And furthermore, they were complaining about scientists not knowing much about the humanities uh, at all. Uh, at the same time, C.P. Snow noted uh, those same intellectuals actually knew almost nothing about the sciences and that they did, did not seem to bother them. So he wrote this book. He first gave a talk and then wrote the book, which was called The Two Cultures, where he basically uh, described a schism that he thought has developed between the humanities and the sciences. Now, if you look at Galileo, uh, Galileo would not have even understood what, what C.P. Snow is talking about. You see, Galileo lived during late Renaissance. Uh, so uh, even in terms of, uh, you know, the chronology, I mean, we could call him a Renaissance person. But, uh, but he was a Renaissance person in every other aspect too. Already at age 24, he gave two lectures on the on Dante's Inferno. This is from Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, so, uh, you know, he was very familiar with that. He could cite Dante and he gave lectures on the location and structure of the Inferno. He, he was uh, also a great admirer of uh, this poet, um, Lodovico Ariosto. Um, he could cite entire passages from him. He actually wrote an essay comparing him to another poet, Tasso. Uh, he thought Ariosto was far superior to Tasso and, and so on. But it wasn't just in, in you know, literature and, and poetry. 
Uh, first of all, he was a musician. His father was a musician and a music theorist. And uh, Galileo was an accomplished lute player and uh, very often played with his father. But not only that, as I said, he studied himself drawing. Uh, but in addition to that, he had painter friends. Uh, the famous painter Chigoli was one of his friends. And uh, this is here um, the Pauline Chapel, um, the dome of the Pauline Chapel that uh, Chigoli painted. And I want to draw your attention to the figure at the bottom, which shows uh, the Virgin standing on the moon. And um, if you look closer at that, uh, you will find that Chigoli painted the moon just as it was seen through Galileo's telescope. Until that time, most painters, when they tried to paint this thing from the book of Revelation, they painted the book as perfect and pristine and with no blemishes. But Chigoli painted it just like Galileo saw it. Another famous painter uh, that was a friend of his was uh, one of the great painters of the Renaissance, uh, but, uh, but perhaps the one of the very few uh, women painters, Artemisia Gentileschi. And she painted this painting, which was uh, Judith uh, beheading Holofernes. This was her first version of the painting. But she spoke to Galileo and he told her about this business of projectiles uh, tracing a parabola uh, when shooting in the air. And she applied it to the blood squirting from uh, Holofernes's neck. So in her second version, if you look at the same area at the bottom here, you will see this, where you actually see the blood uh, creating these parabolic trajectories. And this is her second uh, version of, of this painting. Um, uh, and for some reason, things got stuck on me here. And I cannot tell why. Um, I have no idea what, what is happening here. I apologize, but uh, we do have a technical issue here, which I'm trying to resolve. I cannot even escape from the presentation. Um, I don't know what's happening. Do you want me to cancel out of it and bring it back up again? Please do. All right. One moment, everyone. Do you want to hit screen share again? Okay. Uh, okay. I'm not getting it. Let's see. All right, everyone's gonna sit tight for yeah. one second. I'll, I'll um, do it again. I'll, yeah. I'm doing it again. I'm oh, awesome, that's great. Yeah. Okay, now let's right. see if that, however, advances perfect. me or not. Well, perfect, I wouldn't say because I <laughs> have now advanced to a place where I didn't want to be, but okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go now back. Okay, yeah, so uh, we, we saw the second version of, uh, of her painting and, uh, and, and this, this is the full second version. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, okay, uh, let's now jump over a few decades in Galileo's life uh, and uh, this book that he wrote um, uh, and tried to publish in 1633. Uh, this was uh, called the Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems. Uh, and the book was written as a conversation among three people, uh, one of whom represented Galileo himself. Another one was uh, an educated but lay person. And the third one was supposed to be uh, an avid Aristotelian. Um, Galileo happened to call that person Simplicio, which 
uh, was actually named after a great supporter of Galilea, of Aristotle's theories, uh, but it also has somewhat of a connotation of a simpleton. Um, in this book, Galileo, anybody who read the book immediately sort of saw that Galileo was uh, strongly supported the Copernican model of the solar system and was basically ridiculing uh, the opinions uh, of Simplicio, who uh, was defending the Aristotelian views. Um, Galileo knew that, uh, and, and his friends told him, that uh, he wouldn't get permission to publish the book. You see, to publish a book, uh, then you had to get permission from um, the Catholic Church. Um, so for the book to be actually accepted, uh, he added the preface and a conclusion section, uh, which seemed to say that, yeah, yeah, uh, whatever he said in the book, actually things are inconclusive. You cannot determine whether the Copernican or the Ptolemaic uh, Aristotelian version are correct. Now, unfortunately, this preface and, uh, and conclusion really looked to anybody who read the book as an afterthought. And in fact, a special commission that was appointed to say whether Galileo uh, you know, uh, defended Copernicanism and it concluded that absolutely defended Copernicanism. And one of them even said that uh, he holds that opinion. Um, now, that was considered heretical, and I should also mention that 17 years earlier, actually, there was an injunction against Galileo, which, in the strict version of it, did not allow Galileo neither to hold, nor defend, nor teach in any way uh, Copernicanism. Uh, he had in his possession a letter uh, from the chief cardinal at the time, Roberto Bellarmino, uh, which was a somewhat softer version that basically said that he couldn't hold the Copernican position, but didn't say that he couldn't teach it or, or talk about this. So he thought he was okay, uh, but that didn't fly very well, and he was put on trial. Um, I, I want to emphasize now a few points here uh, that Galileo had in, in his discussion with the Inquisition. Very often, when people talk about the Galileo affair, uh, they present it as if this was a clash between science and religion. It absolutely was not, and Galileo never saw it as such. Galileo was himself a religious person. The clash was between the science that he was presenting and literal interpretations of the Bible. And Galileo's point was that one shouldn't interpret the Bible literally because the Bible is not a science book. He said, for example, the mobility or stability of the earth or the sun is neither a matter of faith nor contrary to ethics. So there is no contradiction, he said. And he pointed out that, look, as evidence that this was not written as a science book is that you know, you don't even, the, the names of the planets are not even mentioned uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, so basically his point was, was that the Bible was written for our salvation and not as a science book and therefore should not be taken as a science book. And that whenever there is an apparent conflict between what observations and experiments tell us and a literal interpretation of a biblical text, it means that we just missed the interpretation and the, it had to be different because the Bible, he said, was written for common people to understand. So, you know, the language was not scientifically accurate. His strongest point on this was that he said that he did not think that the same God who has given us our senses, reason and intelligence, wished us to abandon their use. Uh, so basically, you know, you're saying if observations and reasoning tell you one thing which appears to be contrary to a literal interpretation, it means that you need to change the interpretation. Now, unfortunately, all of this did not help him. Uh, and uh, he was put on trial. He, he uh, uh, 
the reason perhaps was perhaps an attempt to to reach some sort of a plea deal but uh, that didn't work particularly well and the bottom line it was that uh, this resulted in one of the most uh, horrible events in our intellectual history where Galileo uh, on his knees uh, was uh, found vehemently suspected of heresy and forced to abjure. Uh, I want to make a point here. Uh, with eyes of today, of course, we see this trial as an uh, assault on intellectual freedom. Uh, you see, the, the point is that uh, irrespective of whether Galileo was talking about the correct model, suppose that the Copernican model was the wrong one, but it was still his right you know, to write about this. Uh, the church did not really have the right to uh, condemn him, to uh, prohibit his books. You know, th this book, the dialogue was uh, on the index of prohibited books until the middle of the 19th century uh, uh, and so on. Uh, now, the, the, they read the, this, uh, this verdict and he was supposed to, you know, abjure and recant all of this and and he did you know he recanted on his knees again i abjure curse and and detest the above mentioned errors and heresies uh which basically went against much of his life's work uh so this is a, a really horrible incident now i do want to emphasize that from its own perspective uh, because Galileo didn't tell the people who gave him permission to print the book um, about that injunction from 17 years earlier, um, you, you know, the, the church was right to find him guilty uh, that, uh, in, in that. Um, but uh, as, an, as an assault on intellectual freedom, uh, there is no question about this. Uh, you know, I, I hate to use the following phrase, but uh, Galileo ended up uh, uh, giving them the finger. This is Galileo's finger, uh, which is in the Galileo Museum in Florence. When his body was moved from a rather obscure grave to the current tomb where it is, uh, a couple of fingers, a tooth, and uh, even a vertebra were, were removed from his body for whatever reason, and those are now here. The point, however, is the following. Uh, in 1992, Pope John Paul II recognized that Galileo was right and the church was wrong. Uh, here is what he said. He, he basically said uh, simply that... Oh, and again, we, we lost connection. Uh, Kate, can you please uh, do something? Kate? Oh, sorry, my mic was off. Hello. Oh, it, it appeared. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. So, so, oh, it appeared. Um, the Pope said, paradoxically, oh. Galileo. Oh, I, I canceled your screen. Do you want to screen share again? One minute. Oh. Sorry, I canceled that. I thought we were redoing it. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's my fault. All right, here we go. It's okay now? Yes. So uh, Pope John Paul II in 92 said, paradoxically, Galileo, a sincere believer, proved himself more perspicacious on this issue than his theologian adversaries. The majority of theologians did not perceive the formal distinction that exists between the Holy Scripture in itself and its interpretation. So basically, the Pope completely agreed with Galileo, but it took some 350 years for that to happen. Uh, pope Francis, here I am with a Pope, only that it's not the real Pope, it's a cardboard image of the Pope, but it looks very real. This is at the Catholic University of America. And Pope Francis also said, the Big Bang does not contradict the divine act of creating. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation. So 
two popes now uh, basically you know agreed that there is no uh, thing i want now this is all i want to tell you about galileo but you see the book is called galileo and the science deniers and uh, like i said one of the reasons i uh, i wrote the book uh, one of the main reasons is because we are unfortunately encountering science denial today. And I want to give you uh, one very clear example, and that has to do with climate change. But uh, look, I want to make my, my uh, what I present here completely nonpartisan. I just show you some data and you, you, you can judge for yourself. Uh, this shows the carbon dioxide concentration in the Earth's atmosphere in the past 50 years measured very very accurately as you can see and the main thing i want you to look at is not so much the values of the concentration but the enormously rapid rate at which it is changing over these past 50 years and if that did not impress you enough and or you certainly maybe did not convince you that this is somehow related to human activity i, I want to show you the past 300 years so the, here it is the past 300 years. And then if you look from about 1850, I remind you, you know, the Industrial Revolution around 1848, uh, to here, look at the rise in the concentration, in particular, the rise in the last 50 years. Furthermore, if you look at ice cores, uh, people can determine, uh, scientists can determine the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, even in the past 10,000 years. And this is what it looks like. So you can see that it, it sort of bounces all over the place, but, uh, but look at the rate at which it is happens in, in the last 50 years. And we even have from ice cores data for the past 800,000 years. Um, uh, and, uh, but this is not the right figure. So again, uh, Kate, I'm, I'm stuck again. Hello, I am here. Want me to exit out? Uh, I, yeah, because yeah, I like cannot. To, yeah, would you like to screen share again? Yes, I will. We're getting really good at this. Uh, yeah, but it's unfortunate. Yeah, if I'll give a talk for f seven hours, then maybe we will by then be perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, so, there we go. Oh, let me, let me see here if this plays now. Looks good on my end. So here is the 800,000 years. Um, so you can see that, I mean, because people say, yeah, yeah, but the CO2 concentration changed over the years, and it, it has indeed, and you can see the changes here, but but look at what happens in, in, in the recent past. I mean, it just blows off the, the, the graph here. So, um, so when you have today situations where people uh, try to ignore this or try to deny um, well, first the existence of climate change, but uh, after that, you know, uh, whether humans had anything to do with this, uh, this is, I think, what they should remember. And, um, you know, again, it's very sad that we are in the middle of a pandemic now. Uh, and this pandemic, at the very early stages of the pandemic, uh, in the US, for example, uh, you know, st statements such as, uh, oh, we now have 15 cases and very soon it will be close to zero, uh, did not help. I mean, there are now models that show that uh, had the initial response uh, been, uh, you know, to actually trust the science, uh, you know, uh, we could have ended up with uh, far fewer uh, people dying from this uh, disease. So basically, I want to finish here uh, with... Um, some lessons from here and there is a main lesson this is galileo's tomb um, it's a beautiful tomb uh, I, here you can see me standing in front of it uh, it is in the basilica of santa croce in uh, florence and it is by the way right across from the tomb of michelangelo the 
painter. Um, and uh, the main lesson here is the following. It, you see, it is never really a good idea to bet against science. Uh, and to do so when things like human life or even the future of life on our planet are at stake, it is really unconscionable to do. Uh, and it is not the science is always right. Uh, scientists are actually the first to admit that science is always only provisional. Science is only as good as, you know, the data that was available to create the models and things at a given time. Uh, but science also self-corrects. Uh, sometimes the self-correction is very rapid. Sometimes it may take decades, but it does self-correct. So basically, the main lesson is believe in science. And so I want here to thank you, and I will take questions if there are. All right. So I will so, escape this and close it. Yes. Um, so everyone, if you have questions um, about about this book or any of um, Dr. Livio's previous work, you can feel free to enter them in the question box below. Um, but let's look at what ones we have so far. Um, Dr. Livio, Richard asks, what was the relationship, if any, between Galileo and other enlightened scholars of his time, such as the Jesuit Athanasius Kirchner? Might have pronounced that wrong. Yeah, so not not with him, but uh, he, he definitely had, uh, you know, he was in good relations with many scientists of his time. In particular, um, for a while, after that, they actually had a quarrel, but for a while he was in good relationship with Johannes Kepler, very famous astronomer. Uh, they exchanged correspondence. Uh, he was in relationship with uh, Jesuit astronomers and mathematicians at the Collegio Romano in Rome. Uh, with some of them, he had uh, very serious disagreements. And in particular, he was uh, very annoyed when they didn't come to his defense, uh, even though uh, their observations fully confirmed his. So, so he was uh, you know, in, in relationship with, with other people, uh, people of science at, at the time. All right, um, Paul Greenberg asks, does science tend to advance in constant small steps building on itself over a long time with many incremental contributors or does it advance with vast leaps by lone geniuses like Galileo? Who is the Galileo of the 21st century? Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I imagine from the question that uh, this person uh, also read Thomas Kuhn's book uh, which talked about uh, revolutions in science. Uh, but the truth is, I think, that uh, science advances in both, not, not in one of the two uh, rather than the other, but in both. I mean, uh, there is a lot of incremental work which eventually leads to a revolution. Um, so, uh, but sometimes the incremental work is not so noticed uh, and then the revolution is much more noticed. Now, of course, there are revolutions that are um, inspired by, for example, in Galileo's case, also by technology. The fact that suddenly there is a telescope that's available. Uh, so when you have something like this, clearly that is like a quantum leap. Um, when you have people like Einstein, who suggest general relativity seemingly almost out of thin air, um, you know, in the sense that it was not in the air at all, then that's the type of revolution. But, uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, most of the time it's, it's more incremental and also, like I said, dependent on technology. Who is the Galileo of the 21st century? I don't know that we have one yet, to be honest. I mean, uh, you know, for a while we thought that uh, uh, string, super string theory will be an answer to many questions. Uh, now there are serious doubts whether that is actually true. Um, so we, we don't really know. I, I think that uh, with advances in new telescopes and things like this, we will have very uh, new discoveries. We will have many new discoveries. 
Um, Mark Helton asks, how do we combat the continued assault on science that's still happening 400 years later? How do we turn the tide back to science? Yes, uh, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, uh, as I said, I think that the current uh, sidelining of science is, is alarming, uh, to be honest. Um, and what worries me more is that there are some studies which appear to show that once adults have formed certain opinions, it is extremely to change, extremely difficult to change those opinions, even if you present them with, you know, clear contradictory facts. And so that the only way, in my opinion, uh, to uh, combat this, uh, but it takes time, is to really start from with young children and throughout the whole education system. I mean, the education system, not everybody should become a scientist. I mean, God forbid that all society were scientists. I mean, we need the humanists, we need the artists, we need, you know, the musicians, we need all of that. Uh, but we do need to see, and, and I have a whole chapter in the book about this, we need to see science as a part of culture, as a part of one human culture. Everybody needs to have an appreciation of science. Everybody needs to, you know, know, for example, that in Galileo's time, people lived their life expectancy was half of what it is today. And it's only because of science. If you look at the difference between what we call the modern world and the medieval world, the main difference has to do with science. So people need to, to have this appreciation of what science is and, and they need to know some basic things like that there are laws of nature, that the whole universe appears to obey and things of that, of that sort. All right, I'm picking another one. Um, a question about Galileo. Given his fascination with dropped objects, did he ever tackle the question of gravity itself? Sam Birdie asks this. Yes, it's a very good question, and the answer is no. <laughs> uh, he, he didn't. Uh, Galileo, uh, you know, he was a, a revolutionary, but in some ways he was still a prisoner of, you know, previous views. So he did not believe much in force, mysterious forces acting across distance. And this, for example, this is also, for example, why his explanation for ocean tides was completely wrong. I mean, Galileo wasn't always right. He was, on many occasions, he was wrong. Um, so uh, he didn't understand. Even though Kepler already suggested that the moon had something to do with tides, but Galileo never accepted this. So no, he, he studied motion itself and found some laws of free fall and so on, which all of which helped Newton. But he wasn't Newton. He, he, he did other things. Mm -hmm. This is a related um, or question about his research. Was Galileo aware of Giordano Bruno's supposition that the distant points of light called stars were actually suns similar to our own? And he whether... Was. Aware of this or not, did he have his own speculations? Well, he, he was, yes. I, I yeah. didn't show among his many discoveries that actually he turned his telescope to the Milky Way. And he saw, he showed that, you know, what uh, normally looked, uh, you know, almost like a sort of continuous light, you know, uh, broke down to, uh, to many, many, many stars of, of different luminosities. So he understood that there were was vast number of stars, and he was aware of uh, Giordano Bruno's fate. He was burned at the stake, unfortunately. Yes. Mm. By the way, had Galileo been found not vehemently suspected of heresy, but to be heretical, he would have been burned at the stake too. Concer so Michael, I don't even know what to say to that. That's horrible. <laughs> concerning, um, so Michael Connolly asks, concerning the term intellectuals, a parallel term, intelligentsia, has been in use for some time, at least on the continent. Did intelligentsia refer to both scientists and literary scholars, or only the latter? And if the latter, was intellectuals a response to the foreign Bolshevik term? Uh, 
Well, I don't know if it was a response to the uh, Bolshevik term. Uh, look, at Galileo's time, you know, if we go back 400 years, uh, certainly there was no um, very, very clear distinction among, you know, artists and things and scientists and so on. You know, Leonardo da Vinci famously did lots of uh, science experiments as well as being a painter. Uh, Albrecht Dürer, the painter, who, by the way, uh, was born on, on this date today, uh, May 21st. Uh, he was a great painter, but he was also a, an accomplished mathematician and he did all kinds of things. So, so people uh, around that time, uh, they did both. The, the, the distinctions were blurred between being an artist and being, you know, people were architects and at the same time, you know, they were painters and uh, this. Um, surely the phenomenon that uh, C.P. Snow noticed um, I don't think really started in the 1930s. It probably started before that, uh, but he kind of, you know, documented it since then. Uh, that schism, there are people who still think today that that schism exists. Um, there are people, uh, you know, like humbly myself, who try to bridge the gap, you know, by writing popular science books and things like that to make it clear that this is part of all one culture. Um, Randy Calvo has a question that is rather bleak, but a very interesting thought experiment. Does the professor think that the COVID experience will be the end of science denier deniers if they die from unprotected behavior? Uh, no, <laughs> no. I, first of all, I don't wish anybody to die, uh, even if I completely disagree with their opinions. Uh, but it would not be the end of science denial. I mean, and the fact is that even now, yes, I mean, we are living through a stage where there is no question that the response of the US was inadequate, at, at least at the very early stages, and maybe even to some extent now. Look, uh, here is a statistic I, I, I looked at. I. I looked, for example, on, on May 14, I looked at the number of deaths in the US and South Korea. And uh, I, I looked, uh, South Korea has 52 million people. Uh, the US is uh, 328. Um, I, I calculated the number of deaths per million people in South Korea and in the US. Uh, in the US, the deaths per million people are where on May 14, 264. 264 people died per million of population. Do you know what that number was in South Korea? It was five, five. What in the US was 264 in South Korea was five, 5.03 to be precise. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that they their response from the beginning was, you know, followed the science and they did the contact tracing and the isolation, you know, and all the steps that we eventually ended up doing, they did it right from the start. And Vietnam did things like that. Uh, Germany, to some extent, Germany, the number is not as good as in South Korea. They have something like, 90, had something like 95 deaths per million. Uh, citizens. Uh, Germany has a population of some 83 million people. Um, but uh, again, you know, they responded more quickly and followed the science. So I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and I think I'm going to take Sydney Redner's question and, and spin it a tiny bit. So Sydney asks, what would be your answer to someone who doesn't agree with the consensus on global warming, which I know that you've talked about some, but I think maybe for the people in our own lives, right, who not just global warming, but um, are not keen to look to science as a part of culture or as a source for decision making, what would be, um, how would you respond to the people in our own lives like that? Well, look, I mean, what can I say? You see, I, I, I showed here those graphs. I think th this is totally nonpartisan. I mean, those graphs speak for themselves. Uh, 
we see that you know in the past 50 years I, again i'm not talking the specific numbers i'm talking about the rate the rate of change is unprecedented in 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 history in recorded history in, in any fashion so clearly we are facing a serious problem here and even if you are not 100% convinced that humans are responsible for this there is no doubt that human activity if we continue to burn fossil fuels and this does not help the situation so we must do something because you know if not places like bangladesh like florida and so on may be underwater uh, so so we have to do something about this and hopefully everybody will recognize that at some point and yes it will cost money yes uh, you know uh, now what with this pandemic it didn't cost money of course sometimes things happen and they are so bad that you, you know it costs money and it has you have to pay a price and the price may be very very difficult yes i mean we have now you know so many unemployed and and and, and these things it's 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 horrible i i recognize it that it's horrible but it is also horrible to have hundreds of thousands of dead people you know so well it's a it's a sad note a bleak note to end on but unless well, you have believe believe in science is a is a very positive note I agree. That's a very positive note to end on. Um, and that's kind of what this science book talk series is all about, after all. Um, well, thank you once again to Dr. Livio for your presentation and for your patience with technology and with Crowdcast. And thank you to all of you out there for spending your evening with us. Um, please feel free to learn more about this important book and purchase Galileo and the Science Deniers at the link below. Uh, so, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading, and please, please be well. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Kate, and thank everybody.